Okay, so definition of, uh, of uh, source to sink. Basically, uh, I, I give you here the, the definition uh, and there is this little uh, diagram. So the source to sink, and I abbreviate it S to S, it's often uh, abbreviated like this. Uh, it's an approach uh, of sedimentary geology, which consists in studying sedimentary systems as a whole from sources to basins, okay? And so just this very first sentence uh, has a lot of implication. And if you look at it, there is an important word in it, which is sedimentary systems. So for instance, you see that I divided on this drawing uh, the, the, the source to sink system in three zones, erosion, transfer, sedimentation. And in the erosion zone, it's already a system that produces sediment. Okay. In the transfer zone, mostly sediment passes by, but some of it is stored, whether it's for a short period or a long period. And then it ends up into the sedimentation zone. Okay. So this is very important to have this definition in mind is that we now be, you know, before a sedimentary geologist would only consider the basin, only the, the, this zone, the sedimentation zone. But in fact, to understand this zone, you actually need to understand the transfer and also the erosion zone. Okay. So the, the definition continues. It involves the quantitative characterization of the processes involved in the production, transfer, and deposition of sediments. So now here, the, the important words are quantitative, processes, and again, production, transfer, and deposition. So we are sedimentologists, perhaps, but we are also interested in geomorphology, tectonics, transfer, paleoclimate, etc., etc because you see this system is actually the surface of the earth. We have mountains, for instance, it could be something else than a mountain, it could be just a hill uh, or, a, or a rift uh, shoulder. Uh, we have a transfer zone that can be short or long and we have a basin. Okay, so uh, of course, uh, of course, the, there is a, uh, you know, this, this approach is very global uh, and it's uh, a systems approach. Uh, a systems approach, we'll, we'll come back to that, but a systems approach means you consider the processes active outside of the system and inside of the system. And it's applicable to the big variety of the geodynamic context uh, on Earth. Um, and also, of course, it involves uh, a large amount of disciplines, uh, as I said before. Okay. Now my next uh, slide. So now I want to follow the, the, the outline. Um, and my big chapter uh, here is, is to know a little bit about the history of the approach. And uh, this goes from studying the basin to studying the sedimentary system. But on, on this kind of uh, section uh, title, uh, I put the, the cover of the book by uh, Stanley Schum, which is a 1977 uh, book. So I was one year old and, and uh, you were not uh, very, uh, very old uh, yet. So uh, the fluvial system is an old book. And you see there is this drawing, which is probably figure one of the book. And as you can see, uh, a long time ago already, uh, people were thinking in, in those terms. Okay. Zone one, sediment production. Zone two, sediment transfer. Zone three, sediment deposition. And this, this uh, simple sketch made by hand already embodies a lot of uh, vision and knowledge. Uh, and so this is the kind of sketch you have to remember. And you have to be 
able to draw as well. Uh, okay, you, you should be able to draw everything uh, that you that that we that we teach you. Um, the other learning, the other uh, or teaching that that uh, I wanted to to convey with uh, showing you the, the this this uh, book is that there's always someone who has thought about about something before. So it's rare that we are the first one to think about something. And the the other thing that to know is that there's a there's a lots of lots of concepts are developed at any at any one time but it takes 30 40 50 years before we teach them and before they become widespread uh, of widespread use in academia and in industry so uh, so there are innovations uh, but those innovations, they take a lot of time before they become widespread. If you think about electricity, uh, if you think about, uh, I don't know, relative, uh, uh, general relative uh, relativity theory uh, in physics, uh, it always takes a lot of time, several decades before what somebody, what a scientist thinks about uh, becomes used uh, in academia, in industry, and becomes a, a subject of teaching. Okay, so 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 a good way to to if you if you follow a, an academic career or or um, let's say an intellectual career uh, in the industry, a, an important thing to do is to is to keep on with uh, literature. You you really have to read, read, uh, read. Uh, but also read old stuff and the newest uh, stuff. But reading is uh, is your job. Uh, you have to read. Uh, you have to read, and not I would say not only about science, uh, but but also about the tons of uh, different things. Read just read broadly uh, everything you can read. Okay, so there are several chapters here, uh, five little chapters. The first one is about sequence stratigraphy. And the dates I put here are 1980 to 1990. And this was the time of the all eustatic. I don't know if this rings a bell. Uh, later in the course, I will, I will take uh, those, those, um, those, uh, those concepts back to explain them well to you uh, so that we show you you master them but um, sequence stratigraphy is a, is kind of a, a discipline it's what it was a revolution uh, obtained by the use of geophysics uh, especially seismic uh, seismic acquisition such that uh, geologists in the oil industry could see uh, you know, the geometry of sedimentary strata onto passive margins. And, and they discovered this kind of, of architecture. And they try to understand why there is such architecture. And so this, for instance, is called the veil slug. You know, V-A-I-L, like Peter Veil. He's the, 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 the person, the, the main scientist who was working at Exxon um production and, and research um and he he really pushed that uh and and he really uh worked hard on understanding this and created a frame of of understanding that became sequence stratigraphy uh so it's a it's a kind of a logical frame and deterministic in the sense that in this theory of sequence stratigraphy uh there is a um, um, sorry. I come back here. There is a, a, a direct connection between parameters and results, so it's deterministic. Um, and basically, it 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 gives uh, to the sedimentary geologist 
a frame to interpret the deposits they see. And in particular, it shows that the deposits are organized spatially and temporally. So, so for instance, what you see on this diagram is that there are, you know, the colors represent what are called systems tracts, the cortege sedimentaire. And so you see the yellow is somewhere you see that this is a, a passive margin with the shelf, oh, sorry, some fluvial system here, the shelf and the slope and the basin. So we have turbiditic uh, deposits here, maybe shelf edge deposits here. And then we have a TST, transgressive system strat here in green. These are gonna be different deposits. They are not gonna be turbidites. They are gonna be shelves, for instance, barrier island, and then we have a high stand system struct, HST. And the high stand system struct is going to be deltas, for instance, with a slope system. Um, so, so it tells you basically at any one time in the basin what kind of facies you have uh, on your profile. So you can predict the lithology because the facies of a beach is different from the facies of a turbidite. Uh, and so you can predict exactly what kind of uh, facies and lithologies you will have um, in your basin. Okay, it's very predictive uh, for that. So it's a spatial and temporal organization of deposits. And this is important for the oil industry. It was important for the oil industry because the lithologies you look at, the facies you look at, they are the fundamental determinants of whether your rock is a source rock, a reservoir, or, um, or a, a cover. Okay, you, you, you know, these are, uh, to my understanding, I'm not into the oil industry at all, but you have a, a rock that produces hydrocarbon. The hydrocarbon migrates into a reservoir and it stays in the reservoir if there is a cover. Okay, so, so knowing the facies is fundamental because then you, you can predict uh, this, okay? It's not enough to go and find the oil, of course, but it's important. And um, this succession here, you see we have yellow, violet, green, orange, and blue. This succession is a sequence and it's repetitive. So in a basin, in a normal basin, you would have a repetition of those, okay? Below here, you see a Wheeler diagram, W-H-E-E-L-E-R. A Wheeler diagram is distance on the x-axis and time on the y-axis. So for instance, it tells you that in your basin from proximal to distant, you first deposited this layer, then you add this layer, then you add this layer, etc. But you see, it tells you, it shows you that the, the turbidities of the basin floor fan, BF or BSF, are, uh, no, sorry, BF, are here deposited in the distal part and at the beginning of the sequence. Then the deposit, they migrate towards the left, okay, landward. And then the transgressive system is a big onlap. You know, your, your locus of deposition migrates landward, okay? And then during the high stand system strat, you keep on migrating landward at the same time as you migrate seaward. So you still have an onlap, you still have accommodation and accumulation on land at the same time as your deposit migrate landward. And the shelf margin system struct, there is a big shift in the locus of deposition. Okay? So these two diagrams uh, go together. This is the veil slug, la limace, the veil, um, and this is the, the Wheeler diagram. So I spoke mostly here for sequence stratigraphy about the industrial application, but 
uh, in the sequence stratigraphy theory at the beginning, Vail and his collaborators, they observed that, sorry, I come back, that this type of sequence, they can find them every, basically everywhere in the world, in all the basins they know. You know, a company like Exxon has uh, data in uh, uh, East America, West Africa, Asia, Brazil, everywhere, basically. They, have, they had data everywhere. And so they could look, for instance, uh, let's say in the Campanian, the stage of the Cretaceous, they could look at the sequence they have in East America, on the Eastern margin of America and in West Africa. And they could compare and they, they found, or they said that what they found was that the sequences were the same, okay? So the sequences were global. And so they started to draw with age and by synthesizing all their data, they started to draw a global uh, synthesis of this onlap. You see the onlap here? This what I show here is how sediments onlap onto the onto land. And you see it, it, it goes up, 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 up on land and then it shifts the basin once. And then it goes up again, up again, up again, up again. Oops, sorry for that, it's my mouse. And then it shifts, it shifts, it shifts again here, and then it, it goes base in wild and then shifts again. So this onlap curve could be global. And because of that, you could actually predict if you think it's if you if you think based on data it's global. You can then predict in any basin in the world, even if you don't have data there. So if you have sufficient data to make a global chart of this onlap uh, on, on the coast, then you can predict where you don't have data. So that's why this was super powerful. And so uh, the next slide show this. This is the coastal onlap curve. You know, here for Kimmerigian, Titonian, Beriasian, Valanginian. So shift towards the land and then abrupt shift towards the basin, then shift landward, abrupt shift towards the basin, shift landward, etc., etc. And these they tied to eustatic sea level. Eustatic means global sea level. Okay, it's a concept. Uh, basically that says when the sea level goes up, it goes up everywhere in the world. Okay, if you have more water in the ocean, you increase sea level everywhere in the world. And that's sometimes not exactly true, uh, but globally, not, in general, it's, it's true. And so from the coastal known lap, from data, they derived the eustatic uh, sea level. And this is a major revolution, not only for the oil industry, but uh, um, so for the oil industry, it's super predictive because if this is true and if this controls the architecture of deposits, then we can predict uh, everywhere what kind of deposits we will have at any one time. So if I go, if I know that my data uh, my basin has deposits here at the in the middle of Valanginian, then I know that there is a big sea level fall and I will expect to find turbidites. If I'm here, I have a very high sea level, so I should be in a sea level high stand. Okay, and I should expect to find deltas on a shelf. So I can predict the type of deposit I will have at any one time, any 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 time, anywhere. But it's also extremely interesting uh, for, um, for the knowledge of Earth history, because you can, I mean, knowing how sea level has varied through time on Earth, in the Earth history is a major advance 
okay, in our in our knowledge of 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 the Earth system. So so it's not only an industrial application; it's a very very important academic and societal uh, implication. Because if this is true, then we ask, okay, why sea level fo was falling there? Why sea level was rising? What are the, the parameters that control this? What does that tell us about our, our past, uh, the past of our planet? So it's a very, very important uh, environmental uh, parameter. Okay. So here is, for instance, uh, a global sea level curve uh, by Hack in 2014, based on sequence stratigraphic reconstruction. And you see that uh, there is uh, variations at quite a high frequency. You see these are million years. So here I have 10 million years. So these changes here are million year time scale basically up and down on a million year time scale. There is an envelope uh, and we have long-term variations. You see, it's going up in the Valanginian, going down there, going up again. There's a down here and then et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so there's the long-term uh, cyclicity. And there are other uh, people who have worked uh, on this, Muller, Cummins, from, from different uh, data sets. And so uh, so this is one of the first uh, steps, I would say, going into source to sync because uh, it's a revolution and it's on, on how to interpret sedimentary uh, deposits. Yet there is a big lack, a big but, is that all of this is made with uh, no preoccupation, no concern about sediment flux. Okay. So in sequence stratigraphy theory, sediment flux is considered constant. All right, I suggest, um, because I'm starting now, um, the second uh, historical uh, step into source to sink. I suggest a small 15 minutes break for a coffee and for you to, to recover. Is that okay? Yes.